Welcome to another session of Missouri Summer Teachers Academy on presidential crises. Uh, this will be one of the few sessions that do not address a presidential election. Rather, we will uh, address the first presidential succession crisis upon the death of the President of the United States, an occurrence in 1841, which will establish numerous precedents in US history. The key figure in this entire succession crisis is the elected Vice President, John Tyler of Virginia, who will become known as the accidental president and publicly derided by his opponents as his accidency. President William Henry Harrison died on April 4th, 1841, exactly one month after taking the oath of office. When news of Harrison's death reached Vice President Tyler at his home in Williamsburg, Virginia, the following day, he was prepared for the news. As he had been apprised of Harrison's illness, he received regular updates and really anticipated news of the president's death. So preparation for the unprecedented occurrence of the death of a sitting president provided Tyler the opportunity to take the initiative regarding the presidential succession, whatever that meant at the time. Immediately upon his inauguration as vice president, Tyler returned to Williamsburg to consider his response if a presidential succession indeed arose, as there was no precedent to guide him. The Constitution offered little guidance as well, as its wording uh, was vague, ambiguous regarding the question of succession. In Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6, the Constitution declares, quote, in case of the removal of the president from office, or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. And the Congress may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed, or a president shall be elected. So the question here arises, would the vice president become actual president? Uh, would uh, the vice president serve in an interim capacity until a new president was elected? Um, John Tyler was a strict constructionist, but he adopted a liberal interpretation of the constitution and decided that the vice president would indeed become president outright. Other than the Constitution itself, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6, really the only source we can turn to regarding uh, the potential succession uh, by the vice president is the founders themselves. So let's take a look at some of the records of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, very early on during the convention, uh, the issue was addressed. And in Madison's notes, he writes on the death, resignation, or removal of the governor, meaning president, his authorities to be exercised by the president of the Senate. Now we know today that would be the vice president till a successor be appointed. So this is the first hint that the vice president could take over the authorities of the, exercise the authorities of the governor, the president, but mainly, mainly in a temporary manner. Later in the convention, during the committee of detail, uh, it was, the notes declared president of E-Senate, the vice president to succeed the executive in case of death vacancy until the meeting of the legislature. So does that indicate that again, it's temporary and that the legislative branch, Congress would determine who would be president? Another clause in these notes, in case of his impeachment, his mission, removal, death, resignation, or disability to discharge the powers and duties of his department office, the president of the Senate shall exercise those powers and duties until another President of the United States be chosen. Hmm. Well, in my mind, that looks like it's temporary. Later, uh, as we reach into August during the convention, Madison again writes in his notes that in the case of his removal, as aforesaid, death, resignation, or disability to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the President of the Senate shall exercise those powers and duties until another President of the United States be chosen. Again, seemingly temporary. In Madison's notes in late August of the Philadelphia Convention, he noted that uh, Governor Morris objected also to the president of the Senate being 
provisional successor to the president and suggested a designation of the chief justice. Operative words, provisional successor. Mr. Madison added as a ground of objection that the Senate might retard the appointment of the president in order to carry points whilst the revisionary power was in the president of their own body, but suggest that the executive powers during a vacancy be administered by the persons composing the council to the president. So here we don't even see the vice president. We see the council to the president. Well, we know that today is the president's cabinet. Mr. Williamson suggested that the legislature ought to have power to provide for occasional successors and move that the last clause relating to a provisional successor to the president be postponed. Here again, provisional successor. The vice president is just provisional. In September, as we get closer to the writing of the constitution itself, it mentions the vice president shall exercise those powers and duties until another president be chosen. In the evolution of the Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6 in the United States Constitution, we see as the convention begins to wrap up uh, the changes, the evolution, the transformation of this succession clause, if you will. Really, that clause came out to be in September Quote, the legislature may declare by law what officer of the U.S. shall act as president in case of the death, resignation, or disability of the president and vice president. And such officer shall act accordingly until the time of electing a president shall arrive. Notice it's and president, not or. And that, that, that's a key part to this. The Committee of Style, which really wrote the Constitution, again, says president and vice president. The death, resignation, or disability of the president and vice president. And later, notice the highlight. In case of his removal, as aforesaid death, absence, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers or duties of his office, the vice president shall exercise those powers and duties until another president be chosen. Hmm. Again, in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. And the Congress may by law provide for the case removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and so on. So again, here we see at the very end what would become Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6 of the Constitution, that the vice president shall take over the duties of the presidency. But again, we have these highlighted both of the president and vice president. So we really don't know if the founders, uh, framers of the Constitution meant for the vice president to become president. Well, let's take a look at several of the other founding generations reflections on this. Uh, in Federalist number 68, Hamilton writes that as the vice president may occasionally become a substitute for the president and the Supreme Executive Magistrate. Well, what does substitute mean here? Is it a replacement, proxy, surrogate? Well, either way, from what Hamilton implies here, it's not permanent, it's temporary. In uh, a reply to George Mason's objections to the Constitution, Civis Rusticus mentions briefly the powers of the vice president do not strike me as dangerous. He will seldom or ever have that devolution of power by the death, resignation, or inability of the president. And if he should, he will exercise it for a short time. Hmm. Temporary? Definitely not permanent. The only real anti-federalist response uh, to the Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6 comes from the federal farmer. And as you can see from the highlighted section, that in case of the removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, Congress may declare what officer shall act as president, and that such officers shall act accordingly until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. So it appears that the anti-federalists confirm the federalist assumption that the vice president was only a temporary president of the United States. So let's return to John Tyler. As one of his biographers noted, uh, Tyler's whole course of conduct in the first few days after he arrived in the Capitol demonstrated plainly 
that he acted with conscious deliberation to establish himself as a president in his own right and not as a mere caretaker for the departed heresy. To ensure his legitimate and permanent succession as president of the United States, Tyler used his foreknowledge to full advantage. Upon getting word of Harrison's death, Tyler consulted one of his closest advisors, uh, one of the more famed attorneys, uh, legal jurists of the day, Nathaniel Beverly Tucker, a fellow Virginian, who advised Tyler to follow Harrison's example and declare immediately that he intended to serve only one term and he would not seek uh, re-election in, in 1844. Uh, Tucker felt that this would provide Tyler greater success in leading Congress uh, and the American people for that matter. But Tyler made no such commitment uh, before heading back to the nation's capital. After reaching Washington, Tyler implemented a masterful strategy to secure unqualified acceptance as President of the United States, both from his supporters as well as his detractors. And the key to this approach was Tyler's unswerving certainty that he was indeed president of the United States, that he was not acting president, as many Whigs assume. In fact, when Tyler received letters addressed to him as vice president or acting president, he returned them unopened. First order of business in his plan was to meet with Harrison's cabinet. The alteration in operations here was Tyler's refusal to follow Harrison's policy of making decisions based on majority vote of the cabinet. Instead, Tyler declared that cabinet members were not equals of the president. Uh, he would seek their counsel, but he would never be dictated to uh, by cabinet advisors. If they did not like this, then resign. And the entire cabinet at the time agreed and remained uh, to the chagrin of uh, Tyler's closest allies. The second step in Tyler's very well orchestrated strategy involved taking the oath of president. This would certify his claim as outright president, which he did with a federal judge presiding and in front of the entire cabinet. Three days after taking this symbolic oath of office, uh, Tyler delivered his first inaugural address uh, as further step of legitimacy, being president. And in that address, he declared for the first time in American history, an individual elected as vice president, quote, has had devolved upon him the presidential office, unquote. Uh, Tyler also referred to himself throughout his inaugural address as either chief magistrate or president. And Tyler left no doubt that he had assumed the mantle and accompanying powers of the president of the United States. An important note needs to be added here uh, regarding Tyler's inaugural. Uh, as part of his strict Jeffersonian old republicanism, Tyler ardently avoided the dangers of consolidated executive power and thus promised a separation of executive and legislative powers, very much in the Jacksonian democratic manner. He maintained that the legislative branch was the direct agent of the people and the mainspring of the constitutional system. The prevailing Whig orthodoxy, which Tyler espoused, was legislative supremacy and a servile chief executive. That is, the president who was the agent of Congress. But for the remainder of his tenure as president, Tyler actually demonstrated a preference for enhancing the power of the presidency as a preservation of the separation of powers. Well, to complete his strategy of legitimizing his presidency, Tyler moved into the White House. And to alleviate any international concerns, that is with uh, keeping national security at heart, uh, about the unprecedented transfer of power, Tyler met officially with the ministers of foreign nations at a ceremonial gathering in Washington. On June 1st, 1841, at the commencement of a special session of Congress, which was called for by President Harrison uh, following his election before he died, of course, both the House and Senate passed resolutions recognizing John Tyler as President of the United States, which laid to rest any lingering doubts among the press and the public that he served only as an acting president. And there occurred little debate on the issue. 
and without any division in the House, and the Senate voted to confirm 38 to 8. One of Tyler's biographers summed up the issue when he wrote that uh, Tyler's plan had worked to perfection. What was potentially an extremely controversial and bitterly contested transition of power in the nation's highest executive office was deftly handled and smoothly finessed by a state's rights Southerner known for his strict constructions interpretation of the Constitution. If for nothing else, John Tyler's place in history was secure as the author of the precedent that established vice presidential succession to the presidency. John Tyler proved to be tenacious and cool under pressure and was able to establish what became known as the Tyler precedent because he had ample time to plan his course of action. By decisive action and adroit political maneuvering during his first weeks in office, Tyler forever made moot any future constitutional objections and established by usage the precedent for the vice president to become president on the death of the incumbent. Tyler, however, as president, would quickly be known as a president without a party. He was elected on a Whig ticket, but he was clearly a Jacksonian Democrat. During the nullification crisis, uh, John Tyler, as a U.S. Senator representing Virginia, cast a lone vote in the Senate against President Jackson's force bill. And for that, Jackson banished Tyler from the Democratic Party. But Tyler consistently enforced Democratic, not Whig, policy during his presidency, uh, causing the eventual resignation of his entire cabinet in protest of John Tyler's veto of the National Bank Bill, which he did twice. Jackson only got to do it once. Well, Tyler then appointed a friendly Whig cabinet, overwhelmingly Southern, and he did consider running for re-election on a third party ticket, often called the Madisonian Party. Tyler later explained that he employed a loose, uh, more flexible construction of the Constitution, not to undermine the Constitution, but rather to maintain the viability of the system of government created by the founding fathers. He said he moved swiftly uh, and deliberately in order to demonstrate to the nation and to the world that American constitutional procedures for a peaceful transfer of power did indeed work. It is interesting to note here that it was clear that people throughout the country were thinking that if elected, Harrison would die before completing his term. This widespread speculation about the prospects of Harrison's longevity in the White House, if elected, affected Tyler during the 1840 campaign. Often Democratic opponents asked him about his thoughts on the succession question. So we see here a uh, forethought, foreknowledge. Tyler was prepared. He knew that this could happen and therefore he established a policy to meet it head on and for that established the precedent. The constitutional legitimacy of Tyler's succession principle will be reaffirmed uh, less than a decade in July of 1850 when Zachary Taylor will die in the White House and um, Vice President Millard Fillmore will succeed him. Fillmore's accession to the presidency went unremarked. The transfer of power occurred without any opposition. Fillmore never hesitated in imitating Tyler's actions and assuming the presidency. There have been eight successions in all under the Tyler precedent. In 1967, the Tyler precedent became officially codified with the adoption of the 25th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Quote, in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. There is an ironic epilogue to this story, however, while serving as President of the United States, John Tyler came within seconds of perishing himself in a cannon explosion on the USS Princeton in February of 1844. In order to rival the Royal Navy, and as part of the Tyler administration's very energetic policy of territorial and commercial expansion, Tyler promoted the building of a new state-of-the-art vessels, and one of these was the USS Princeton. To show off this prized new vessel, President Tyler hosted a public reception on the ship, replete with cabinet members, congressmen, and other dignitaries of the day, 
including former First Lady Dolly Madison, and Missouri's very own, our very prominent Jacksonian U.S. Senator, Thomas Hart Benton. The highlight of the event was the firing of one of the ship's two massive cannon, uh, the largest naval guns the U.S. Navy had built to that time. President Tyler was on his way up to the deck to see the firing when he was stopped by one of the patrons just momentarily. On the third firing of the cannon, which Tyler just missed, it exploded, pretty much sweeping the deck. Among the dead were Secretary of State, Abel Parker Upshur, Secretary of the Navy, Thomas Walker Gilmer, and John Tyler's soon-to-be father-in-law. Benton was wounded, along with the ship's captain, uh, the famous Robert Stockton, and 18 other people. Tyler was en route to the deck to see the final firing, but just missed it by seconds. Keep in mind, there was no sitting vice president under President Tyler. So an entirely other succession crisis nearly occurred under the same elected administration. 